Shack on a hill in the Mossy Creek bottoms of Cane Creek, Arkansas. This is Lighting the Void, and I'm your host, Joe Root. Thank you for joining us tonight, live on the Fringe FM. And uh, tonight, it's a pretty special event. It is for me, if you're into the OBE, out-of-body experience, consciousness, exploration, all the stuff we talk about, the occult, the esoteric. Claude Swanson is here with us, physicist, Monroe Institute, one of the board of directors of the Monroe Institute. As well as massive, man, there's some massive research on this. So we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. Our energetic makeup, what's going on, kind of expanding on from last night's show uh, with uh, Mr. Nichols. That was a pretty important show we had last night, too, Graham Nichols. And so this is uh, going to expand on that, actually. It's going to expand on that even more. So if you liked last night's show, this one's really going to be good. Um, tomorrow night, <clears throat> is open lines, excuse me, and... Uh, we're going to have Barbara Faith Charlton on as long. She's going to bring a guest on with her. And hopefully Ronnie will stop by from Get the Tea, too. And speaking of that, uh, make sure you guys go out and get the uh, winner pack at GetTheTea.com. That stuff, is, that's important. Um, you need to grab that because there's all kinds of people getting sick. A good friend of mine's in the hospital right now from just asthma, allergies, bronchitis, all this stuff. So uh, I'm not saying that it's going to keep you from getting sick forever, but it sure helps. And if you believe in supplementation, then this is the best stuff you can get at GetTheTea.com. Also, AncientLifeOil.com. Big shout out there for all of you guys that have been grabbing that. And uh, PrepareWithTheFriends.com. All the archives are free for this show. So if you missed the live broadcast for any reason, which we hope you don't, but if you do, then you can catch any of the archives for free. Uh, of course, all the commercials are in there and stuff because we have to. that's the, how we keep it free. But we are setting up the membership site for to take all that stuff out. Um, I got a little bit of a sample of something I want to play for you guys because I know I've been telling you that I wanted y'all to go over to contact or go to lightingthevoid.com and visit the contact page. And here's why. I'm working on a video project, but I have an audio sample, and hopefully it works, of uh, like the Voidwalker presentation type thing. But there's going to be monologues and stuff in it. But anyways, I've got a little piece of it here I want to play for you. And this is from, I mean, this is all of you guys. So keep in mind, this is really not me, it's not you, it's us. And uh, before we bring in our guest, I just wanted to play this for you guys to see what you thought about it. Okay, so here we go. Let's see if this thing works. I do not know all the answers to the questions about reality. I do not claim to know the ultimate truth about life. I seek that which has been made hidden as a part of a family 
of Explorers of Consciousness. I am a Void Walker. Hey, this is No Way Jose, a Northern California Piscean stuck in the Arizona desert. I'm a Void Walker, and I got the shoes to prove it. So what do I do when my soul yearns to delve deep into the realm of the unknown? I aim my satellite straight into the night sky and catch a smooth ride on the KTLK DB radio waves. I tune into Lighting the Void with Joe Root on the French FM. Joe, Lighting the Void is the best show on the planet. This is Barney, your friend from Facebook. Thank you and all the crew for all you do. Namaste, my friend. This is Macon from the Foothills, North Carolina, and I am a board walker. G'day, board walkers. This is Lily from Down Under Australia. The world may be small, but the enigma is great. So let your curiosity take you for a journey with Joe Root. Hey, this is V, coming in from Central Maryland, and I am a void walker. This is Kevin Darkerty, a beginner void walker. I'm from Vancouver, BC. I know a little about a lot, you know, as Leonard Skinner said, I guess the rest. I learned a lot from uh, Mr. Root in the show. And I uh, heard it from the beginning. I knew right then he was going to be a New York Bell. Thanks for all your uh, shows and keep it up. Hey, this is Derek from Mass, a.k.a. the Night Stalker, and I'm a Void Walker. This is Mark from Chicago, and I walk the void to ascertain what is consciousness. My name is Jared Johnson, and I'm from Humboldt County, California. I do not know all the answers to the questions about reality. I do not claim to know the ultimate truth about life. I seek that which has been made hidden as a part of a family of explorers of consciousness. I'm a void walker. Thanks, Jaru. Man, you see? You see where I'm going with that? And I probably missed some of them. All right, y'all, let's bring on our guest, Oh, before we do that, make sure you go check out the new season of UFO Seekers, ufoseekers.com. Go check them out if you want some real research on this subject. Let's get down Let's get down with this thing right now. Uh, I'm stoked about this. Claude Swanson is here with us. The website is synchronizeduniverse.com. Dr. Claude Swanson was educated as a physicist at MIT and Princeton University, and during those years, he worked at the MIT Science Teaching Center Brookhaven National Laboratory, and a Virginian cyclotron in the summer. At Princeton, he received the National Science Foundation Fellowship and Putnam Fellowship. His Ph.D. thesis at Princeton was done in the Gravity Group, which focuses on experimental cosmology and astronomy, and was headed by Professor Robert, uh, looks like Dyke or Dyke, I'm probably saying that wrong, uh, Dickey, there you go, Robert Dickey. Swanson conducted postgraduate work at Princeton and Cornell Universities on the design of superconducting plasma containment vessels for fusion energy systems. He then began work for Aeronautical Research Associates of Princeton, a consulting company, and later formed his own consulting company, which carried out studies and applied physics for commercial and governmental agencies. And for the last 20 years, he's been inter- inter- interspersed with his conventional professional career in applied physics, and Dr. Swanson has pursued investigations into unconventional physics. His principal interest has been unified field theory, the so-called theory of everything, which could explain the universe at the deepest possible level. Now, this has led him to investigate many aspects of the paranormal, which appear to be completely real phenomena, which violate our present science. Paranormal phenomena, which have now been proven in the laboratory and in many cases, offer a window into the deeper universe, the mysteries of consciousness, and unlock new forces and principles which conventional science has only begun to glimpse. He has conducted extensive research in a lot of areas, including research of scientific literature, interviews with scientists in these fields, attended and spoken at conferences, and conducted experiments and investigations. To better understand such paranormal phenomena can be incorporated, or how it can be incorporated into modern science. And there's a whole wrap of stuff here. Man, I got to say, uh, Dr. Swanson, like, thank you for doing this for all of us we really appreciate it and thank you for coming on the show and and i am a void walker and you're a void walker <laughs> right that's cool yeah uh, well thank thank you joe uh it's a pleasure to be here <clears throat> yeah i i think i just got involved in this stuff uh from curiosity i wanted to understand how the universe worked and um with all the education you just listed i I felt something was missing that 
I, I have this intuition that we are connected in some deep way uh, throughout the universe. Even everything that all the little forces that go on, the quantum forces. I had a feeling there's a connection to the cosmos and the distant matter and all that. And that idea was proposed a hundred years ago by uh, Ernst Mach, a German philosopher and scientist, but it never really got into current physics. And I always kind of felt something like that would provide a deeper explanation. Uh, and then one day I was working uh, on was some government projects and I heard about something called remote viewing. And that was my introduction to this whole ability that we have of going out of body, uh, putting our consciousness elsewhere, and getting very accurate information about things that could be thousands of miles away. It can be even in the past or in the future. It could be inside sealed uh, safes and, and rooms and uh, just in under conditions that are impossible to explain based upon our Western physics. And yet I was hearing about it in a way that I realized it had to be true. And that was my first uh, wake-up call that there was something missing from our current physics. And that's kind of what got me started. Once I began digging, I discovered all of the paranormal things that you folks talk about and that you know about. And uh, I discovered how much more uh, exists out there than our Western science has left out. So I've, I've been studying that and uh, uh, collecting the evidence for it and also trying to develop a theory to explain it. So I've written three books now uh, trying to pull all of that together. And it, it goes from paranormal phenomena at the at the most basic level where we have even, even lab experiments that demonstrate paranormal phenomena and then up to the most esoteric, which is the afterlife and the soul and uh, and UFOs and uh, the whole business of consciousness at a very high level that not very many people can practice today, not very many humans, but still there are people who can do it. And when you see what consciousness can do, it changes our, our ideas about the universe. So I'm trying to understand all that stuff and, and figure out a, a, a science that can account for it. So it's like you're trying to create... Uh, your own subject field, but with a, I mean, you've got a huge, extensive background into all this. It's, uh, I mean, everywhere from sunken ships of Atlantis to investigating orbs and spirits <laughs> to uh, torsion fields. Uh, what is this? The what Russians called torsion? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, you know, Chinese yeah. medicine. Chi. Are you, is this all the same stuff to you? You it, know, we it, get it different all, names. It, yeah, it all connects together in a way that I didn't see when I first started out. Uh, initially, I knew about some of the uh, uh, the PK, the psychokinesis experiments that the Princeton uh, labs had done, uh, the ESP experiments, the remote viewing. So I started out there, but as you go deeper and deeper, you find that it does go very many places. Uh, it, it does probably connect with ancient societies in the past that knew a lot more about this than um, than we do today, uh, hence an interest in Atlantis, also Egypt, you know, that, that there's a lot of examples in some of these old societies where psychic ability was taken for granted. If you look at some of the, the Indian writings and the Vedas, you know, these um, the meditations that the yogis do and the abilities that some of the yogis take for granted, it's, it's, it's part of a, a tradition where you can be trained, you can develop your mind to be able to do some of these things that we call miracles, and yet they are really are. We all have these basic abilities if we train ourselves. So I've I've dabbled at a very low level in just you know learning about it. I've taken courses in remote viewing. I've taken courses uh, at Monroe Institute in out-of-body experiences and things like that. So I've dabbled a little bit. I have some knowledge of what it feels like. But, um, you know, th to me, the, the, real, the real masters are, tell us, they, they, they lead the way. They tell us what's really possible when you're really good. Uh, I discovered that the, uh, there's Qigong masters, for example, in China.
who use the same energy, this torsion energy, as the Russians call it, the Qigong masters, they call it Qigong, and they have used it for 5,000 years. It is the standard method of healing in some traditions in China. Uh, they do it remotely. There is a, a Qigong master who lives in a cave in China. He gets his uh, orders, his, uh, his patients contact him telepathically, believe it or not, and he sends out the healing energy through the walls of the cave. And we, we know this because one of his students uh, became a Western-educated medical doctor, but also practices Qigong and has written a book about it. So some of these traditions, are these people are so powerful that when you see what they can do, it kind of removes all the doubt about, well, is, is it real or not? You know, it's pretty overwhelmingly uh, convincing that there's something there uh, and it's up to us to understand what it is. Man, I and wouldn't course, agree more. I, <laughs> I wouldn't agree yeah. more. I just, I don't know. You know, you yeah. I talked about your theory of everything. It's like I've had Thomas Campbell on here and read some of his books about the, his theory of everything. And I get, I get that, uh, you know, he looks at it as a simulation. His consciousness has set up this simulation. Now, other than that, uh, I'm just kind of curious where you stand on that. Does it seem that he's right about this? Um, he talks about more entropy, uh, more entropy and stuff, and he makes a lot of sense. But then there's uh, uh, something's missing there. I don't, like, it's hard for me to explain. Yeah, I, I have not gone into his stuff, so I wouldn't want to comment on his uh, stuff. What, what my my approach has been: first, find out what the phenomena are. Right. How does the universe behave? What's the, what's the list of things that we need to be able to account for? And uh, it's a pretty long list. <laughs> and, and and people who don't know, who haven't studied uh, the Qigong masters, these guys can can move objects, you know, many feet away. There's a Qigong master in China, uh, which was studied by um, a physics institute in China for several years. Uh, he could uh, cause Geiger counters uh, a thousand miles away to change to 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 either increase their count rate or decrease their count rate. He could uh, cause laser beams to bend even at great distance. Uh, all kind, of, you know. There's one Qigong master named Madame Sun who was being feted at a banquet in China, and she had some prawns, you know, some some shrimp on her plate. Uh, they'd been boiled, they'd been cooked, they were dead. They were that was served as part of the meal, but to amuse herself, she begins sending her chi energy to the prawns and they get up and start walking around the plate. Okay. Oh man. <laughs> so, so they bring them back to life. Uh, this chi energy is, is wrapped up in life. That's what my second book is called life force. It's about this energy. It's about the scientific basis for it, how it works. And it's these great masters who can have such control over it that really do the miraculous things that are talked about in in many many stories but um the russians uh have been studying this stuff for 50 or 60 years they call it torsion they have equations worked out for it but it's the same energy that wilhelm reich was trying to understand 100 years ago uh 200 years ago in germany there was a baron von reichenbach who found that many people can see this energy when they are either very sensitive or maybe they're slightly ill, they have a their sensitive system, and if you put them in a dark environment, they can begin to see this energy. And he would do very systematic experiments with these things over weeks and weeks and weeks and, and test them. And he developed a whole science. So there's lots of different sources uh, for this energy. It's a real energy that's been left out of Western physics, and it's it's basic to life. It's it's the energy that the acupuncture meridians carry through our body. Uh, it's the energy that makes up the aura that surrounds our body, and that aura is really responsible for our health. Uh, so it plays a role in so many aspects of some of the subtle sciences that have been left out of Western materialistic physics. 
but we have enough information now then we can make a theory for it, we can understand it, and it needs to be brought into our science. And and guess what? It's also the energy of consciousness. So if we're ever gonna if we're ever gonna have a theory of consciousness in our Western science, we have to take this torsion energy and absorb it and integrate it. So when I say theory of everything, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. This, these things need to be included because we have you know, scientific evidence that these things are real, but they're not really part of our present science. See you're, the, see, you're one of the only people I've seen talk about putting the energy and consciousness to, together, because I've always kind of thought that they did go together, honestly, um, just simply because when, when I look at things like uh, uh, the work of the magicians or Dean Radin, they, they talk about this energy. They talk about different bodies. Uh, even their their rituals are designed in this uh, circular type uh, movement. Uh, what they call um, what do they call it? What, what, uh, circumambulation. What, what? Even when they do rituals, they they're they're giving symbols of this this energy. Or when they do like a middle pillar ritual, uh, they give symbols of this energy as well. And then Robert Bruce is one of the only people that I've seen put out out of body experience uh, course that has stuff to do with the energetic body. And now I'm hearing you talk about this torsion field or aura that is directly connected to consciousness how is it connected in what way do you theorize maybe well what the what the russian what the russians well first of all in my my second book life force i go through all the different uh types of experiments i just mentioned you know von reichenbach um wilhelm reich you know the Russians, the Chinese, etc., and 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 William Tiller in the United States, they all did experiments with this energy. It keeps getting discovered over and over again. Each time, uh, the discoverer doesn't usually seem to know that it's already been known by other cultures. So he gives it a new name and he describes its characteristics. Um, one unusual aspect of this force or energy is that it can show up in different ways because it can alter uh, actually the rate of time as well as carry a twisting force to the right or to the left. This is where the Chinese yin and yang come from. They're two different spins basically or twisting directions of space time. Uh, so so we, we know a lot about it but it's all kind of fragmented in terms of our history. So I try to pull that all together uh, in, in my second, second book and say, okay, let's make a coherent picture for it. Well, the Russians already have a theory, and they were actually doing experiments for 30 years probably. It was mostly in classified programs, it appears to be, because they published a little bit of it. But a lot of it was kept secret until the Berlin Wall came down and we had Glasnost and Perestroika in the early 90s. At that point, they released a lot of this stuff. Um, so it's to me, it's a real revolution. It's a, it's, a, it's a force that's related to electromagnetism, but it's not the same thing. Uh, they have they have used their understanding of this energy to build machines. Uh, they can do healing with it. They can alter molecular structures of materials with it. And what they say is that this energy will do anything that a psychic has ever been able to do and more. So they acknowledge that it is the essence of the psychic force and of consciousness. We just, <clears throat> that's interesting. Uh, we're going to take a break, but I'm wondering if it's, yeah, I wonder if it has anything to do with, are you familiar with the electric universe and the theory of the plasma field? Uh, a little bit, yeah, yeah. Okay, I kind of, I want to go down that road with you just to, just for a moment and then we'll get, look deeper into your work and what you've discovered. Uh, we're here with the uh, Claude Swanson, guys. This is Joe Roop. You're listening to Lighting the Void live on the Fringe FM. We'll be right back. This is Corbin, son of the one and only Joe Root, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. 
Did you know that qualified patients can access medical cannabis in all 50 states? Anasense is a medical cannabis collective that helps patients in all 50 states gain access to cannabis medication. Anasense does this with a streamlined process and strict compliance with the Compassionate Use Act of 1996, the Affordable Care Act, and the U.S. Constitution. It is important for each patient to understand the legalities involved, the cost, and the benefits of cannabis medication. Through truth, legalization, and education, the medical benefits of cannabis will supplant recreational perceptions and the real vision for change will be realized. Let the people and their personal doctors take control of their medical cannabis decisions before the greed of big business takes over. The tipping point for change is today and Canasense is ready to lead the charge and enable legal access for all qualified patients to medical cannabis through its proven system. For more information, go to thefriends.fm forward slash care or click the banner on the website today. I think by now we can get the information. I love magic, and on Lighting the Void, each and every week, you will get to hear shows about magic, mysticism, and many other subjects that stretch your mind and imagination. So when I got my mind on the magic and the magic on my mind, I listened to Lighting the Void on the Fringe FM. It's magic. May the gods look with favor upon you. You're wondering what we're going to do to you, aren't you? Come, walk through the mossy creek and up the hill. Never mind the flashing lights and otherworldly shadows. They stay hidden within the trees. Come, step up to the shack and begin your journey to the answers that you seek. This is Lady Anne, and you are listening to Lighting the Void on the Fringe FM. Okay, here we go. Ancientlifeoil.com. Ancientlifeoil.com. Now, this is for CBD, ancientlifeoil.com, again, for CBD. Where do I get CBD? Ancientlifeoil.com. It's pretty good stuff. Organic, non-GMO, we are the Ferrari of CBDs, ancientlifeoil.com. You know, they say when you mention a person's name three times when you first meet that you're going to remember. So I'd say to you, nice to meet you, ancientlifeoil.com. It's ancientlifeoil.com, right? Nice to know that you help people, ancientlifeoil.com. Think about this, occasional stress, occasional anxiety, occasional inflammation, occasional stiffness, and intruders that get you down, ancientlifeoil.com. Okay, so I'm going to give you a fact for the day. So ancient life oil does not help you with business deals. Hold on a second. If you feel better, it could help you make a better decision. Okay, I'm wrong. Just remember to go to ancientlifeoil.com. Good evening, this is Art Bell, and you are listening to The Fringe FM. All right, everyone, this is Justin from the UK. Excuse the chitty chitty. If you're into The Fringe and you want to hear the brass tacks, me old China plate, Joe Roop, and his guests on Light in the Void will open your mince pies. You need to shut your north and south and use your 10-speed gears and listen to them bubble. You could hear a Barry Crocker, no Brussels, but he ain't no holy friar. Anyway, you be the Barnaby Rudge and take a butcher's. You're listening to Lighting the Void. The call-in number is 1-800-588-0335. If you would like to text, you can text in at 501-777-5631. Well, Dr. Claude Swanson is our guest for tonight, and we're going deeper down into this field of study of consciousness, the out-of-body experience, paranormal activity, and his recent uh, research into looking into what has been called qi, or Chinese medicine, or prana, or torsion by the Russians. Uh, and I believe the New Age community calls this uh, the aura. But there definitely is some type of energetic field around us. I mean, there's just too much stuff to back that up. And how it relates to consciousness, I guess that's what we're going to talk about. And before the break, I was asking you, uh, uh, Dr. Swanson, if the, how, if you were familiar with the Electric Universe at all, uh, they have this theory that, that, that everything has this kind of ethereal plasma field that we don't see, that science just hasn't discovered yet. And it makes a lot of sense when you look at it. And I've talk to uh, some of the guys about that 
And but I'm just curious what your thoughts on that would be because it seems like science is definitely looking for some something that's not there. Uh, every month we pull an article about how they're looking for a dark matter or the God particle or something, and I think it's like they're looking in the wrong directions. What What's your opinion on that? Yeah, I, I've I've read some of the Electric Universe ideas. Um, I haven't seen a coherent or complete theory that would convince me that it explains everything. But one thing I do see is that you can probably explain gravity as an electromagnetic phenomenon. Um, and um, even even in my model, in the theory that I have sort of developed and worked with, uh, at the, so the smallest level, particles are always – uh, bouncing around, they, they call them the Zitterbewegung, the, and that's what the Germans used to call it, that if you could see a, an electron, for example, at a very powerful microscope, you'd see it wasn't really sitting still, it's zipping back and forth because the energy of the vacuum is constantly bombarding it and knocking it around. And so it, it on the average, it sits in one place, but really it's sending out photons uh, particles of, of light in all directions and they get absorbed uh, at great distances away by other matter elsewhere in the universe and so really that's to me how our universe is connected that's what keeps things in place that's what causes inertia that's what causes the uh, identity and the properties of particles um, and, and so you can take a picture like that and you can notice that there's a way of explaining some of those electromagnetic exchanges as being gravity. In other words, that we talk about electromagnetism when you have a charge and around that is an electric field and we have a, a force that we know in our science that it, it exerts on other charges. But if you have two charges that are canceling each other out, one positive and one negative, then uh, in our present picture, we say, well, they cancel out, and so there's no net force. But if you could look on a small scale, you'd see both of those particles are actually shooting photons out all the time, and there's there can be a net gra gravitational force from the combination. So you'd say, well, it's electrically neutral, but these little particles that it's shooting out, on the average, uh, can exert a force – and if, if if there's no net charge, you'd say that you know it's not um, it's not electrical. Uh, it must be gravity. And so we can explain gravity from a flow of these little photons uh, at a very small scale, as it's like a rain of photons all the time that's passing through the vacuum. And for example, uh, if you you are near a large mass like the Earth, and that rain of particles is coming down on your head, it could push you down toward the Earth. And um, you might think that that's just, you might call that mass, you might call that gravity. It looks just like it if you can't see the little photons that are causing it to happen. So in this way, we could really see how a, you could make a, an electrical model for gravity. Uh, by going to a finer picture. And I think that's probably probably correct. Uh, some of the Russians have done work where they, they, they start noticing that there are some other effects that we don't talk much about uh, in, in, in Western physics. There are what they call like gra gravitomagnetic effects and things like that, mm -hmm. which are – a analogies, analogs between gravity and electromagnetism. And some of these forces, which appear to be real based upon their research, would is likely only to be true if it's all really electromagnetic at the deepest level. So I kind of suspect that something like that is, is correct. Um, but I still would like to see a complete you know, theory for it or, or, or work one out myself so I really can see how they all fit together. But that, you know I mean? that's kind of that's kind of plausible, yeah. The whole scientific method, right, is to, you know, you have a theory based upon your data research and evidence, and then you 
you have to find a way to put the the scientific method to that theory uh, because you have a hypothesis. I mean, that's basically uh, what you do in science with everything. And I love it, the fact that, man, like I do really feel like there's so much more science going on with this now. Uh, You were telling me this during the break, uh, how you've been on the board of directors and been members of several organizations just recently at the Monroe Institute, and now you're moving into a, a different organization, and it's... Um, are we making progress? Are we getting any answers? Just from a layman's point of view, for me and my audience, that we're on behind the scenes, not seeing all the stuff that you guys are doing, just kind of hearing about it every now and then. Uh, do you feel like, as far as science goes, that we're making progress, actually? I think one of the problems is that Western physics has been mostly government-funded, and therefore... It's kind of a big bureaucracy where the funding is determined by groups of scientists who are part of the mainstream. They they think about problems that are kind of accepted by the culture, but the ones that are forefront, the more the ones that are more fringy, uh, further out, they don't uh, necessarily. Uh, value the way they should. Uh, Like consciousness, for example, uh, scientists 100 years ago realized that consciousness affects quantum experiments. It affects the double slit experiment and in ways you could actually measure. So consciousness is a real phenomenon that affects physics, and yet it's not accepted or understood as part of the mainstream physics courses that are taught in school. And, and what that means is that if physics were really operating the way it should, uh, there should be big programs, big research programs to fund you know, projects to figure out what consciousness is, how it works, let's get it into the theory, you know, and yet that doesn't seem to happen. Uh, it's, it, it's kind of the scientists on the fringe or the outer edges who – push these things forward, uh, like the Princeton Pear Lab uh, back in the uh, 70s. Uh, Robert John there at Princeton, the head of the, head of the engineering department, uh, you know, very good scientist, and he probably had uh, some, some secret government funding. That's the suspicion. But it certainly wasn't anything out of the National Science Foundation. It was nothing official. And so this is the way it's been with a lot of consciousness research that we don't have the big guns the the powerful funding organizations of our society supporting these things it's mostly um, you know occasional benefactors here and there or one scientist here and there uh, I, I I do believe that we're close to some kind of breakthrough but it may come from outsiders more than from the mainstream established scientists well, yeah, I hope that, see, I hope that we change that because it also seems like that scientists in this field um, have have to provide more evidence than regular scientists would. We've discussed that, too. Like, if you're going to come out and make this big claim, then they're going to want more from you than they would, you know, uh, I guess we would say regular science or whatever. But, okay, um, I just wanted to kind of know where we are at. Now, um, on your website, thesynchronizeduniverse.com, uh, there is a picture of you, and beside that on the front page, it looks like um, a picture of something that I've saw before. Now, is this something that's out in space, or is this an actual orb that you've taken a picture of? Before I ask this next question, I just want to know here. Um, I, well, first of all, I, I'm not quite sure I can remember. I think that's a, a, a galaxy or a, a cosmic cloud, isn't it? I think there's a yeah. I think okay, it's a large yeah. Um, it's just it's it's a pretty picture <laughs> yeah right but you can see this this torsion in everything in the universe and everything in nature it's in everything yep. um you can you can in fact what the russians what the russians talk about is that torsion does show up in a lots of common places that you would never expect for example uh the human body is symmetric on the outside, right? We have a left arm and a right arm. But if you look at the alimentary canal and where the liver is and where the stomach is, it's not really symmetric on the inside. And our organs actually are organized in kind of a spiral fashion. Hmm. And that spiral fashion actually takes advantage of torsion. 
they also talk about the earth itself. Uh, we all know that the earth is not a perfect sphere. Uh, but the, some people say it's pear-shaped. But the Russians actually explain that that pear shape is due to torsion, that, that it's a rotating massive object. So therefore, it does have torsion forces because torsion is connected to spin and to rotation. Uh, and so the torsion forces arise on the Earth, and it, it's not the same on the North Pole and the South Pole. Um, so at the North Pole, if you look down at the Earth, you'd say uh, the Earth is uh, what, spinning to the to the. Let me see to the right. Is that right? I think I so. Think, yeah, and and so and that and and by torsion theory, that's a right-handed torsion field. Uh, which is has an anti-gravity property and it has certain um, uh, effects on consciousness, sorry, very very direct effects on consciousness, how things grow, uh, the et cetera, et cetera. If you go to the bottom, the South Pole, it's the opposite pole, and therefore the gravitational effects are different and the consciousness effects are different. And what they can explain from that is this is why the Earth has a pear shape. It's, it's it's actually lumpier and it's wider below the equator than above the equator. And they say that this is also the reason why continental drift over the millennia has caused the continents to be more in the northern hemisphere. Uh, so the Russian scientists have used torsion to explain a lot of things that you would never think of. We just take for granted, but it, it offers an explanation. So, um, I think we're just at the beginning of understanding uh, torsion. Uh, the, first of all, a lot of these books and, and writings have not been translated into English or they're not widely available in English. Uh, so we need to absorb this into our society and integrate it so more people really understand what it means. Yeah, I'm totally convinced of it, actually, because... Um, just in some of the esoteric books I've read, like I was telling you before, there's so many hints about it. Uh, even, uh, in Eastern books and Western esoteric books, it's almost like they know. Uh, so like people have asked me, there's a couple of rituals that people do in these groups where it's, uh, it's like a pentagram and hexagram ritual, but the, what it's really showing is 2d. Once you learn 2d and the elements, and then you go up to the next, and it's like, um, and I know this is just all symbolism, but it does something to the mind and your consciousness. And then once you go up to the uh, uh, hexagram ritual, well, now you're talking about the outer planets, and the outer planets move in a 3D way. And then they have, like, double cube altars, and, uh, you know, the Sefer Yetzir, which is an old book written by rabbis, also talks about the makeup of this. And if you really look at it, and some of the secrets of alchemy and uh, the nature of the 3D universe that we live in, that's exactly what they're explaining. I mean, they even call it circumambulation inside the ritual. So I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I'm just saying there's so many other things that point to these this torsion uh, energetic thing that, we, that you're looking at here and gravity and such that it's just too obvious. It's just way too obvious to me. Yeah, in, in my books I talk about the chakras, for example, mm -hmm. because if you look at the chakras from the front, and a person is healthy, they are rotating to the right. And that is actually pulling energy in. Um, and so the direction of the chakra also is connected with the flow of energy, either into or out of the body, and is very directly related to torsion. Um, and and the, again, the acupuncture meridians, uh, people use curly in photography uh, to, uh, to make images, spark images, of the acupuncture points and you can there's um, a technology called gdv uh, developed by a russian uh, in which he can use these spark images of the acupuncture points to analyze in detail a person's health it sort of does the same thing that an acupuncturist does but it's done in an electronic way um, it turns out that the spark images at acupuncture points is based on torsion that when there's more left-handed torsion you get a bigger spark when more right-handed torsion you get a smaller spark so it's the torsion flow out of the acupuncture point that determines the uh, 
the image, the acupuncture image, and therefore, and that is the aura. So wow. our, the, our, our human aura is very directly connected to acupuncture and also to torsion. Now, <clears throat> where is this related to, like, um, hmm, like black holes, right? Well, if you've seen a black hole... What do you think uh, that is? What is your, I mean, I'm not asking you to prove it because there's been so many scientists that have been wrong or don't know. And, but I'm just wondering, based on your view of things, what do you think, is, what do you think that thing is? Well, I, 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 I was in grad school in the gravity group and uh, back in the 70s, I guess. And we studied black holes. Uh-huh. So, and, 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 you know, the, the basic explanation of a black hole <laughs> is that it's a mass that has become so dense that the gravitational field bends light and it can't really escape. So anything that falls in can't really get out and the light uh, can't get out either. And so um, it becomes something that doesn't emit any light at all. It only absorbs, and therefore it looks black. And that's the standard model. That's a that's a prediction right, from yeah. Einstein from Einstein's theory. Um, so, you know, I, I don't have too much complaint about it. I mean, I think that people find as as we're learning over time that that's a first approximation. And if it's uh, spinning, there are other you know, things about it that have to. It's more complicated. Uh, and so <clears throat> that's just a starting point. But what the Russians <clears throat> in their torsion theory say is that these two different forms of torsion, the left-handed and the right-handed uh, torsion, which are, it means the space-time is twisting either mm-hmm. to the left or the right, it corresponds to what the Chinese call uh, yin and yang qi, which also have a left or a right spin direction. It's the same thing. What the Russians say is that the uh, left-handed chi, left-handed torsion, uh, will have an attractive force. So it will increase, and they've done experiments to prove it. It's not just theory. In fact, going back to the 1950s, uh, Kozarev did experiments to show that this energy actually has an attractive force, and it'll attract anything to it if it's left-handed torsion. Uh, likewise, if you have right-handed torsion, it'll repel anything. So it's an anti-gravity force. So to me and to the Russian scientists who studied this, uh, this is significant and it ought to be part of our gravity theory that Einstein's theory that's taught in school is just sort of the first draft. And, you know, if we want to go further, you need to include the torsion that the Russians have developed the left-handed and the right-handed. Uh, if it's left-handed, it'll be more gravity. If it's right-handed, it'll be less gravity or anti-gravity. Now, this is exactly what astronomers have discovered out in space. They look at these galaxies, and they find that a lot of them have more gravity than they're supposed to have based upon Einstein's theory. And But instead of fixing the theory, they say, oh, well, there must be something we can't see, so we'll call it dark dark matter, and we'll just make that up, and it's a fudge factor. They've never found it. They, they've looked hard for it. They right. can't find it. But but they, they make the assumption that we're not going to change the theory. We're just going to invent a particle. Uh, by the same token, there are cases where there's anti-gravity or uh, reduced gravity effects out in – the space. And again, they say, well, you know, we'll pretend or we'll make up the idea. And they're, they're pretty serious about it, uh, that uh, there's something, some particle that causes anti-gravity or a repulsion effect. Well, it, again, it's right in that basic Russian torsion theory, that force, that's the right-handed torsion. And it's part of the theory. So to me, it makes no sense that they're going around inventing new particles which they can't find when the Russians have a perfectly good theory that seems to explain all this stuff. Wow. Yeah. To- <laughs> yeah. I'm totally with you on that. I th- okay. So I, when I say I'm totally with you, don't think that I've done any, anywhere near the research you have, 
But what I'd like to say is, is that it's the gut feeling of putting the dots together of, of all the guests that I've talked to and all the stuff that I've done and all of the books that I've read that say that I totally believe you're right about this. I mean, I do 100%. I mean, th- this has to be connected with our consciousness somehow, right? Like what they're looking for is a direct connection between what we would call energy, that what causes movement in these torsion fields uh, in the universe and in nature and our consciousness. That's what they're looking for, I think, and they can't, it's not there. I don't know if we'll ever find it. Well, they have to look. For, <laughs> they have to look a little harder. I mean, <clears throat> there have been experiments done on the Earth um, in which they've shown that left-handed torsion actually increases uh, ESP and increases psychic ability. Wow. Um, and even uh, American uh, scientists, uh, th- these are two guys who sort of founded the the School of Magnetic Healing called Davis and Rawls. <clears throat> they use uh, permanent magnets on the acupuncture points to heal people. Uh, and they've done a lot of experiments. They, they're not... They're not, you know, well-trained scientists, but they have a lot of practical experience. And what they found is that if you take the what we would call the the south pole of a magnet, the the, the pole that normally, let me see now, normally would I'd be be pointing toward the south, I guess. If right. you let it let it be free, free to spin, uh, if you take that pole and hold it over somebody's third eye, that is the center of their forehead, the, the brow chakra over the middle of the forehead, uh, they claim that the ESP uh, is increased. And I have not seen any, they haven't published any data, not the, not the kind of folks who, you know, publish good statistical papers or publish them in the journals, they write books. And so you have to kind of take it for what it's worth, but they seem quite sincere and they have a good track record on a practical level. And so when they say that, that's very consistent because that pole is the pole that has the left-handed torsion. Um, And therefore, again, they're getting a correlation between left-handed torsion and ESP or psychic ability. And there are a few other things like that that I came across. So uh, again, it's just more along the same story of this connection between torsion and consciousness. Wow. How many pages is this new book you wrote, The Synchronized Universe? Is it pretty extensive? Uh, Well, if you go to my website and look carefully, uh, you'll find that there are three books. Uh And um, the, the, the first book, the first book. Let me let me give a kind of quick synopsis, if that would be okay. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, I guess around 1999, um, I decided that I might not get the the great unified field theory ever figured out. So I better write up what I had, and I had about 40 chapters that I've been collecting over 20 or 25 years with all kinds of data. And um, a friend of mine suggested that, well, take take the ones that kind of are the easiest and the most direct and maybe, maybe the widest interest, put them together, the simplest ones, so in the first book. So I did that, and that's my that's called the synchronized universe. You know, in that book, there are there's a chapter on each type of paranormal phenomena: um, remote viewing, levitation, uh, ESP, psychokinesis you know, out of body, things like that, uh, one chapter on each. And I, I pulled together the best scientific evidence I can find to prove that this is real. And then in the last chapter of that book, I offer my so first cut at a theory for how we can explain and how, and how we have to modify our present science to account for these things. And the the biggest modification is sort of what I was talking about a little while ago, that little particles at a small at a microscopic scale are interacting with each other all the time. They're, they're zipping around back and forth, and they'll be sending out little photons and being hit by photons at a very rapid rate. We don't see that. We see the average effect of that, but it really does go on. And I was able to show from that that the universe that we are in, that we consider to be the real quote-unquote universe, is really... The, the particles 
whose motion is synchronized with one another. They're vibrating at a at the same frequency. So they see each other, they interact with each other, and they would say, You're my you're my universe, I'm your universe, this is but there can be many other particles that vibrate at a different frequency. If you're huh. at a different frequency, okay. you, you won't see them. You won't feel any net effect from them. They'll be invisible to you. But if you were to shift your frequency, then you'd see that universe and the, other, and the first one would, would go away. So in this way, in a very natural way, we live in a multiverse. We live in, in, in a, in a what we think of as reality, but it's just one plane of synchronized particles. There can be many other planes that have different frequencies that are right next to us that we're moving through all the time. We're not aware of, but they're just as real as we are. And that little, that insight explains how um, the Philippine healers, for example, can put their hand through a person's body and right. heal the inside without cutting them or, or anything else. Um, it explains how uh, the Chinese uh, EHF students, these uh, young kids who had uh, psychic talents that were identified by the Chinese government, could cause uh, beans, beans in a bottle. The, the government would do experiments with them. They put beans in a bottle, tape, the, tape up the cap of the bottle, put it inside a box, tape up the box, seal it totally, then put them in a room where they were watched by scientists and say, okay, now get the, bo- get the beans out of the bottle. And these kids could teleport the beans out, out of the bottle, out of the box, into their hands without damaging the container at all. That's just one example of the kinds of teleportation experiments that have been done. You can't explain that if you assume matter operates the way our physics course tells you that it does. There has to be a way of turning off the force that repels particles from other particles. And the synchronized universe idea explains that. If you can shift the frequency of one particle versus another, the force will go away. And that's how you can penetrate matter. So teleportation and lots of other things like that can be explained. There are lots of people who will talk about how UFOs can go into mountains sometimes. Um, you know, this is again the same thing where, where this ability exists of turning off the force that repels particles from other particles. So, it, so that was just that was the first book, and I'm really giving you a really quick overview of it. Uh, but the next question I had to answer is, uh, okay, uh, these are some paranormal phenomena that are kind of hard to explain, you know, on the Western point of view. <clears throat> how do we? How do we? What is? The, what's the force? What is the force that makes this possible? And that's where I discovered torsion or chi. Uh, and I found that the healers and the PK experts, they're always be able to manifest this special energy. And when that energy builds up, that's when the weird stuff happens. That's when the laws of physics, as we know it, get broken. And that's what I call the life force. And so that's the name of my second book. And I have... It became a big book because I, I included all the different kinds of evidence uh, from the Russians, the Chinese, uh, William Tiller, uh, and, you know, all the different scientists who've learned about it. So it's about 800 pages, that book. Uh, it's been called a tour de force, and we've got to get very good reviews from people. Um, and the third book is uh, I began realizing, okay, uh, first of all, you know, as I get older, you start thinking about, well, what happens next? What, what, what's next in life? You know, is there something, do we continue? Does our intelligence, does our consciousness go on after death? And you, you learn enough things that you, you really want to know for, for many reasons. And I realized that this energy of torsion, which appears to be the key to consciousness, uh, and therefore it could be the energy that makes up the soul, might be a really important ingredient that has been left out of Western science uh, because the Western scientist is a materialist. You know, he says, well, you know, the, the body, the body weighs such and such of, you know, hydrogen and different chemicals. And when the body dies, 
that's it. Nothing left. If you cremate the body, it's all gone, uh, and therefore afterlife is impossible. And that was what a materialist would say. But what if there is an extra special energy that is not affected by those things? And that's what torsion appears to be. The torsion makes up the aura around the body, but it also appears to make up the soul. And and therefore, it, it does, and it's also when you go out of body, there's something that's called the astral body. It looks like a sphere, like an orb that people have often seen. Uh, it's the center of consciousness when you go out of body. And that is contained in this special energy. So it's really the key to consciousness, and it's also the key to the afterlife. And it's that appears to be torsion, at least at least in part, or probably in large part. So my, my third book is all about the afterlife and um, the evidence for the soul. And um, it's another big book, about 700, 800, 800 pages or so. And I've gotten really good reviews for that too. Uh, Dr. Norm Sheely um, says it's the best book ever written by a physicist. <laughs> uh, wow. But I've, yeah, but I've gotten some other really rave reviews. Uh, if you go on my, on my website, uh, you'll you'll see the reviews by people. Uh, so the, the books, the books are all pretty serious in the sense that I, I, I focus on the the events, the information, the what we know about what happens. But I'm also really trying to, you know, someday uh, do the science. I want this. I want the science to come out eventually. So I'm trying to be pretty thorough about this. Yeah, I can tell. And, you know, I can already see some people like Joe, you know, you don't know who Claude Swanson is when I was first started talking about this. And I was thinking, uh, I just had an out of body experience. All right. So this, the, <laughs> you know, I'm new to all this, but I, every, I'm telling you, uh, Dr. Swanson, like everything that I've seen, everything I've studied esoterically and metaphysically without, you know, this is kind of right brain stuff. And I know you, you told me during the break, you're more of a left brain kind of guy, which is fantastic. Right. But it all corresponds with this. Now think about this. I want y'all to think about this real quick. Cause we've got to go into a break here. One over break. And this is for Kurt green, uh, back in scripture, the wheels of Ezekiel, right? The four faces yeah. of a man, the four elements, wheels within wheels, Y'all think about that. That could be correspondence to that. We'll be right back with Dr. Claude Swanson. Stay with us. the number one cleansing tea in America. We cleanse you with organic ingredients, and when used daily, you can increase your energy. Cleanse from intruders that set up camp in your colon. Cleanse your colon and feel the difference. Colon cleanses can be uncomfortable. Not Life Change Tea at GetTheTea.com. Life Change Tea is mild, yet truly effective. Cleanse your insides every day. Easy to make, easy to use, and feel the results. Are you sold? Okay, then, here's how to order. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Look for our specials on the front page. Get the Tea also carries top-rated supplements for those who care about their health naturally. Again, log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. And feel the results. And for those of you that arm yourself with information, come to our webinar every other Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. That's every other Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific. You can sign up at GetTheTea.com. I'm Ryan Gable, and I want to remind you to keep your radio, phone, tablet, or computer tuned to The Fringe FM. And visit the website, TheFringe.FM, to listen to the entire lineup of shows. You can also catch my broadcast, The Secret Teachings, Monday through Friday, beginning at 12 a.m. midnight U.S. Pacific Time, right here on The Fringe FM. Alex X. Hi, I'm Alex Exum, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. This is Reverend John M. Polk. Please 
visit me at johnpolkmedia.com and visit my show, Quantum Hologram Matrix, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, every Tuesday on thefringe.fm. Hey, Fringe FM listeners, did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or no Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of the Fringe FM by calling 701-719-3971. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. Saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Call 701-719-3971. That's 701-719-3971. Listen to the Fringe FM on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Hey, is that a new music app? Yeah, check it out. Surfer Music Discovery. It links to thousands of online stations, but the twist is you see the song names and artists that are now playing live. That's different. No guessing. Looks like a waterfall of music. So many formats. Rock, oldies, country, R&B, jazz, and a whole lot more. How's that spelled? Surfer. S-U-R-F-R. Is it expensive? It's free. No need to sign up or sign in. Get the Surfer Music app free from Google Play or the App Store. OMG. People are jumping on board to the Life Change Tea Regiment. Brew, steep, and drink for a gentle, taste great cleanse. It's changing how they feel. See what everybody's talking about. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Life Change Tea aids in digestive slowdown and helps people get moving down a healthy path. We won't make claims. We'll just let you decide. Experience is much better than a commercial anyway. If you want results, log on to GetTheTea.com and purchase your super strength cleansing tea. You won't be disappointed. And if you're looking for some mind-body suggestions, go to YouTube and punch in the search bar, Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now. Put power into your health now. So, get the tea.com. That's get the tea.com for super strength tea. And YouTube, Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now for valuable suggestions. Get the tea.com, the tea that makes you go. From the kingdom of Arkansas, you are listening to Joe Wood and Lighting the Void here on the Fringe FM. Hola, Fringe listeners. This is Dave Cruz of Beyond the Strange, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. To call Joe, pick up the phone, dial 1-800-588-0335, toll free from the United States or Canada. You're listening to Lighting the Void Radio. Well, we're talking to Dr. Claude Swanson tonight, and if you go to the website, thesynchronizeduniverse.com, there is a ton of information on there, plus you can scroll down and see the books that are in sequence as well. You guys, if you want to get a, get in on that Voidwalker promo, all you got to do is go to the contact page and uh, just put your name in there, say what you want, or say the creed, and uh, you'll be a part of it, because I want to get as many people in there as I can. I'll probably use your clip, too, uh, Dr. Swanson. You said it right off the bat when we started, right? <laughs> you're uh, most welcome to. Okay. <laughs> you know, this kind of stuff that you're talking about, it makes me kick myself uh, for not continuing my education in math. I was two years ahead in math in school, and I was so happy to get out of high school. I didn't want to mess with it again. But um, it's important that we understand, I guess, you have to be able to do equations to figure some of this stuff out, too, right? I mean, that's important. It is important, and to go deep into it, you would need that. However, I've written all three of my books without equations. Uh, there, there might be one equation in one of the books that's kind of slipped in because it had to be there. But in general, I, I think intuitively, and I express myself in pictures and in concepts. So I, I, I try to avoid uh, equations in these books. I'm going to have to write a book with some equations in it one of these days. But I, I t- when I when I was at Princeton in grad school, I helped teach a course called Physics for Poets, and this was undergraduates who were not physics majors, but kind of wanted to know a little bit about physics. So I and my advisor taught this course, and these were nice, uh, you know sophomores, sophomores, juniors, who they were usually humanities majors, things like that. And 
it gave me a rich appreciation that some people just have math phobia. You know, they're, they're, oh, yeah. they, they, they get petrified if they see something like that. Uh, and I didn't realize it. I, I was, the course was going well. I was mostly doing the experiments and we would have the lab experiments on different types of things. And it was always fun. Uh, but one day I, I made what I think it was a mistake. I, I, I wanted to explain quantum mechanics to them a little bit. I wanted to give them just a feel for it. And so I put one equation up on the blackboard and everybody was petrified. <laughs> I, I was, I wasn't prepared for that. Just did so, all, the, all the eyes got wide in the room, right? Like, Oh no. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's like, how oh, do we have to know that on the test? You know? <laughs> right. and, and so I, you know, I try to keep my books are, are emphasizing the concepts and the evidence, but not I don't I don't put any equations in the books. Well, fantastic, because then I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, man, when I look at these books. Am I going to understand the math? And uh, that's cool. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. Um, OK, so let me see if I understand this right. Some of the things that that you're saying kind of make sense as far as. Uh, multiple realities, multiple timelines, multiple dimensions. It's uh, just correct me if I'm wrong here. What you're saying is, is everything's running on different frequencies. So literally right now, there's another reality going around us under a different frequency um, that's still using this torsion, uh, this torsion theory. We just don't see it because it's on a different frequency. And the funny thing is, is that you bring this up, and I'm reading uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza's book about how to change your mind, and he's talking about the nature of atoms and how it's 99% space, and if we really look at everything, this would make a lot of sense. If you looked at it relatively, right, um, this could happen. Yep. Mm-hmm. And, yep. um, man, it does get complex, though. It starts to really get simple, and then the more you look deep into it, well, how does this work, and how does that work, it starts to get complicated pretty quick, doesn't it? Well, well, the way I think about it is that um, if you're on one, I, I call like like a synchronized system of particles as a synchronized universe. It's like one sheet of paper where everything on it has the same frequency, the same phase. They're all seeing each other, interacting with each other. So any other universe and other reality has a different frequency. It'd be like a different sheet of paper. So think about the multiverse is being a stack of paper, many, many sheets of paper, but we, everything we know about is just on that one sheet. Okay. And, and all of our physics is about being on that one sheet and how things interact. That's of course, that's, you know, I'm making it, it's a sheet is a two, it's a two dimensional surface and our reality, you know, is four dimensional. So I'm, it's an analogy. It's not, a, not literally true, but the idea is that our everything that we know is occurring on this synchronized universe, this one this one sheet of paper. How how, how do you shift to other realities? Uh, in in my model, uh, one of the ways is by torsion, because torsion can change the rate of time, and it's the, the sheets are separated by frequencies. Therefore, if you can change time, <clears throat> you can shift to a different sheet of paper. And therefore you can bring in other things, other energies, for example, other forces that are on some other sheet of paper, uh, or you can leave this sheet of paper altogether. Uh, so, so torsion kind of comes in as a way to I- interconnect these different parallel realities. So that's, that's, you know, in a real nutshell, how I think about the connection. And have you based a lot of this too on your personal research with uh, the paranormal, like uh, ghosts and hauntings and uh, the fact that there's so much uh, electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic activity. I mean, you see all these uh, paranormal investigators stuff. They got the, they got their tools and and it just goes off when they pick up the energy but I've that's never been enough for me. Like this kind of explains it a little bit more. But however, there is when real uh, paranormal activity happens, there is a lot of electrical interferences, like at the Omen House and stuff. Have you witnessed that yourself? I, I've witnessed some of it. Um, I've been in haunted houses where I could feel the energy. I've been in haunted houses where I could feel the coldness, where it gets it feels like it's about twenty or thirty degrees colder when you're near a place where there is an entity. Um, 
I, 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 there's a there was a ghost hunter I knew in Virginia who went to great lengths to to shield all of his electronic devices. He put a uh, mu metal, some magnetic shielding metal around all of his boxes because these these paranormal energies will cause magnetic effects and other interferences that'll screw up your measurements. Um, in in my theory, um, the electrical effects are probably a more they're a, they're a consequence of the paranormal because when there's paranormal energy there, which is in a simplified way, maybe just torsion energy, when it's present, it'll change the frequencies of all the particles that are there. And that'll bring in electrical forces that weren't there before. So the electrical forces may be a consequence and not a cause. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. So, um, here, let me think. I just had that question in my head. Okay, so the afterlife, when people, when we meet someone that's passed away, or people have out-of-body experiences, and they meet entities like at the Monroe Institute where they have audio recordings of of people that are talking to entities that are stuck in this realm. Mm-hmm. Do you think it's because, just theoretically, that uh, they're, they're resistant to that next frequency or they don't want to move into it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's because... <clears throat> that they carry their consciousness with them. We all do. When we die, our consciousness is still with us. And so the physical matter may not be there, but our consciousness is still present. So we're kind of aware of what's, what's going on around us. Uh, many, if, if someone is afraid of, of, uh, of the afterlife, they don't maybe believe there is anything else or they have some strong emotional attachment to something here on the earth. It might be their children. It might be the house they live in. <clears throat> For whatever reason, they they want to hold on as best they can to the earth vibration. Well, it turns out that as part of the aura around us, our energy field around us, which again is is largely torsion, uh, <clears throat> that that there is a layer that allows the soul to interact with the physical world. It's uh, an intermediary. It's called the etheric layer. And uh, that's, it's kind of necessary for the soul to be able to interact in the, in the best way or the strongest way with normal physical matter. Uh, when we die, uh, the natural process is that we release that etheric layer. It sort of dis- dissipates over a few hours to a day or two, typically at longest. And when it dissipates, then the soul is able to perceive the next higher plane, which is the next. It's, it's a higher vibrational level, which corresponds to the afterlife, uh, and, and it's, it's called the astral plane. Uh, it's what we would call. It's one of the lower levels of heaven. It's where people see the light. They see their loved ones come and visit them, um, and there's a whole process that we go through after that. And I put a lot of detail about that in my book because it's amazing how much we know about the afterlife and about the processes we go through. And I did you know, a lot of research over 10 years in collecting all this information. So there's, there is a process, there's a system that we go through. Um, so so that that's interesting to me but that's what happens when that etheric layer dissolves then we see a light we'll see uh, a light being a guide we may see loved ones who have come to help us cross over Um, we enter a realm of light and our afterlife period begins but if we hold on to that etheric layer then we don't ever see that that afterlife level, and we stay kind of stuck to the earth, but it looks kind of dim and dull and dark, and we don't quite know where we are. And uh, the soul rescue cases, like um, there's one that Monroe Institute has made available publicly, where they they were doing a soul rescue and they um, met some entity, some being who believed 
that he was still alive and was at sea in the ocean. His ship had sunk. He was holding onto a piece of wood. I remember that. And had been, yeah, right. It was a famous case, you know, and he'd been holding onto it for a long time. And of course, the real truth was he died, but he was still holding onto that etheric layer because to him, that was, that was his survival. That's all he had. Uh, and in the session, what the, the person interacting with him, talking to him, said was, look around, look around behind you, see if you see somebody. Because in those cases, when we're stuck like that, our guides, our, our guardian angel, if you want to call them that, there are many guides who are at a higher uh, vibration in the same system and, and will be there ready to lead you across to the higher plane, but you have to at least see them. You have to at least notice them. So if they're kind of stuck in that state, he looked around and he saw a being of a giving off light behind him. And um, then he, his attention now was diverted. He could interact with that, that being who said, you know, follow me, I'll show you where your parents are, you know? And of course, he loved his parents. He was very happy to meet them, but they were in the astral plane. So he needed a little help to get led over there. And that process is how he let go of his etheric layer. So everyone kind of needs to know to let go of that. Don't hold on to, to that that lower vibration. Let let go because there, there's much nicer places to be. <laughs> Okay, yeah, that makes, see, uh, that adds up to makes a lot of sense. And, you know, Daskalos talked about that, about the etheric uh, realm and things like that, how he had to uh, get himself in a certain state. And he also talked about balls of energy, which we've, you know, we've brought this stuff up on the show, you guys, if you've been listening, it kind of does actually add up a lot. Uh, look, it's uh, we're halfway through this thing already, through the show tonight, so we'll be right back with Dr. Claude Swanson. You guys stay with us. All right, so Thanks for listening to this broadcast. Need another late night fix? You can tune in every weeknight to Lighting the Void with Joe Root on The Fringe FM. Hi, this is David Oman with House at the End of the Drive.com. You're listening to KTLK, The Fringe FM. I like to listen to Lighting the Void because of the guests, the content, and the host, Joe Root. He's smart, he's intelligent. And he seems to ask the questions that we all have on our mind. We're all searching for the truth. And Joe helps us get closer to it. I love this show. I love this show. I love this show. Light in the Void. What's up, Joe? Hey, man, I just wanted to say your show, dude, keeps getting better and better and better. I love Light in the Void and the Fringe FM. Hi, this is Aaron Hunter, host of Real Paranormal Activity, the podcast where we tell real paranormal experiences of people from around the world. And we also conduct interviews with authors, investigators, psychics, and mediums. Real people, real stories, real fear. Thursdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern on The Fringe FM. See you then. Hey, this check is wrong. I worked a holiday and seven hours of overtime. Not getting paid correctly is a real pain. It could also hurt our boss if our company provides out-of-compliance checks. That's right. Construction companies doing business with the government can get fined, or officials of the companies can go to jail if the checks aren't right. It's a law. The Davis-Bacon Act has 30 compliance issues for every check, but there is an easy way for construction companies to be in compliance. 
eMars offers Compliant Client, a web-based system that finds and corrects all 30 of the possible out-of-compliance check issues. Users of Compliant Client report an 80% savings in time and money. Running a weekly payroll usually takes about five minutes. All 15,000 plus clients of eMars have never had a legal compliance issue. Plus, they sleep better on check day. Contact eMars at eMarsInc.com or call 480-595-0466. The Fringe FM isn't just a radio station. We also provide services for all your audio production needs. If you are interested in live radio or pre-recorded podcasts, we're here to help. We even do audio enhancements and voiceovers if needed. If you want to do a podcast or live radio show and even want the option to syndicate on terrestrial radio from simple audio file enhancement to live production and call screening, we have you covered. We have worked with some of the best professionals in the business in order to provide coaching instruction for content creation, show structure, and more. Contact The Fringe Digital Media for more at info at thefringe.fm. That's info at thefringe.fm. Or call 501-777-5631 for a consultation. Do you want to know the truth? Are UFOs real? Are aliens visiting Earth? Are governments around the world hiding the biggest secret in history? We're UFO Seekers, official partner of The Fringe FM, and we're on a hunt for the truth. Join us as we investigate locations like Area 51 by subscribing on YouTube at youtube.com slash UFO Seekers. Alex X. Hi, I'm Alex Exum. And you're listening to The Fringe FM. You're listening to Lighting the Void. The call-in number is 1-800-588-0335. If you would like to text, you can text in at 501-777-5631. All right, so now is the time if you have any questions for Dr. Claude Swanson to hit us up. You can call in at 1-800-588-0335. Also, the direct line is 501-424-5130 or drop a question in the chat. So, um, yeah, this is making a lot of sense to me, uh, Dr. Swanson. I can't wait to get into the material. There are other listeners uh, that are messaging me through the text line saying that, um, you know, they've known about your uh, material for quite some time. And uh, I'm going to actually start off with one of those questions from one of these listeners. And they are they are asking, is the torsion capable of drilling through all the layers of reality? Like that said stack of papers you mentioned earlier uh, through with a spindle. And if that were to occur, what would be the effect? A hole through all the multiverses, would it be like a wormhole to other realities, so to speak? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't normally think about it as drilling. Um, what I, the way I think about it is that each particular layer uh, is synchronized at a certain frequency. Uh, but if you have a, a lump or a concentration of torsion, it will change the frequency uh, in that layer or in a region of that layer. If you change the frequency – then that layer starts to resonate with one of the adjacent layers. And what that could cause is that suddenly you would start to see things that were in a different sheet of paper, a different reality. They would start to bleed in to your reality. So, um, you know, you might uh, see, well, like a ghost, for example, um, a spirit that maybe it's existing at some other frequency, but it starts to become more and more solid uh, as the frequency changes, and torsion uh, could do that. Uh, one of the things I talk about in the third book is what it's like when we die um, <clears throat> and we go through these different layers in the afterlife, which are also uh, planes of consciousness. And there's a process of adjusting uh, where the old life kind of fades away and the new life starts to become more and more real. And that is also 
because that the frequency of our soul is changing that and so it's resonating with a different plane of reality i've got examples in there uh, well there's one man who talks there's a well for, i don't even let me back up for a second um sure. there's so there's so much information in the books that it's hard to um talk about it you know in much detail without spending a lot of time uh, the website synchronizeduniverse.com uh, has more information uh, and, but I uh, for example in my book in, in in science of the soul in the the last chapter I I give an example of a person who was who is now in the spirit world who passed away but who communicates with us through what's called direct voice and I'll explain in a minute what that is uh, but we have we have hundreds of conversations like that where spirits have been able to communicate and tell us what the afterlife is like what experiences uh, they went through and this one man describes what it was like when he died and when he died uh, he um, he was sitting in a chair uh, his body died uh, the doctor came and they carried his body away, but he was still, his consciousness was still present. His soul, if you want to call it that, was still present right there in that chair. And he said he looked around, he, he was trying to figure out what was going on. And he said, now the chair was empty because they carried away his body. But so he sat, he figured, well, he may as well sit down in that chair now because it was empty. So in, in his astral body, his, his soul body, he sat down in the chair and he was trying to ponder what was going on because, you know, our culture doesn't prepare us for what death is really like. It doesn't tell us the, the truth or the whole story. Religions give us only a very partial idea. And so he was unprepared for what happened. So he's sitting there in his soul body in this chair pondering what has happened and as he does so he says the fireplace disappeared the fireplace just kind of faded away and then the wall in the room just kind of faded away and then he could see a green field where there had been a wall before he could see a brook out there and so what was happening is the reality that he was in was shifting because the frequency he was synchronized with was now shifting. And now suddenly he was transitioning into an afterlife plane because the physical reality that he was used to was no longer resonant with him. And this could be the same thing as what happens when the etheric body dissolves. That connection with that earth plane that we were in before kind of fades away. So that's one one person's description of what it's like. We have also descriptions of what it's like in the afterlife um, when they are trying to adjust themselves to uh, the, the first or second layer of heaven, the astral realm of heaven. And again, there is a, a frequency shift that goes on. And uh, usually there are healers so helping angels, if you want to call them that, that help them to frequency shift to become more synchronized with the new plane of reality that they're in. And the beings in the afterlife planes then become more solid, more real. They, became, they become able to move, and that becomes their new reality. And the old reality of the earth plane fades away. So again, this synchronized universe idea helps explain a lot of things about the afterlife. Um, but, but the other point I wanted to make is that in my books, because I'm really trying to go about this scientifically, I'm trying to pull together every bit of evidence I can about what the afterlife is like, what the soul is like, what these changes are all about. And there's a lot of information that I discovered that most people don't know about. Uh, we have ways of that that, that souls uh, communicate with us uh, that are known about by the experts but not by most people um, and and w the, one of them is automatic writing 
where a spirit can take over your arm or your hand and write with with your pen, but they can write what they want to write. Uh, and uh, there, there was a famous medium. Mediums are people who communicate with the spirits, either telepathically or maybe in this way automatic writing, and and they can write very rapidly in this way. And one man's name was uh, Chico Xavier. He lived in Brazil. He was very famous as an automatic writer. He wrote 400 books that were all written by spirits using automatic writing. Uh, He would write so fast that he had an assistant uh, by his right elbow to put sheets of paper under his hand as he wrote. Um, He was pretty much illiterate and had no library, and yet the books are very erudite, and they display a knowledge of many th- many cultural things that he had no access to. So he's one of these cases where automatic writing was a window into the afterlife. Another really powerful way I, I learned about is called direct voice, that some mediums uh, have an energy in their body. It's called ectoplasm, and spirits can use that energy to create a voice that you can hear and record on a tape recorder or listen to in, in a seance. And it's quite clear. Uh, and one of the most powerful and successful of these was Leslie Flint, who only died in you know, a couple decades ago. Uh, there, were, uh, there was a couple who came to every one of his seances and recorded them uh, very systematically. You can go to his website, Leslie Flint trust.com or something like that there's hundreds of recordings made by spirits in seances um, where they talk about their experiences uh, after they died Um, and of course there were many scientists also who tested him to make sure he wasn't faking in any way so this is just two examples of many in my books where i where we, we we know a lot about what goes on after we die um, because the spirits have been able to communicate in various ways. Uh, And let me slip in one more real quick. You were mentioning orbs before the break. Uh, I found that orbs uh, fit together with the afterlife in many, many ways that we have accounts from spirits who spend their time. They, They visit the earth plane and they have to take on the, the form of an orb like being inside a little bubble when they come down and visit the earth plane. But there are also people who have lived in places where these orbs kind of use like a portal. They'll come they'll come in by the hundreds and portal into the earth uh, from the afterlife. They'll go out and visit wherever they're going to visit. Then they have to come back and return, return through the same portal at some later time of day. Um, and Native Americans... Uh, have used these orbs. Their ancestors show up in ceremonies uh, in the form of orbs. The Hawaiians call these little orbs uhane, the part of the soul that speaks, and they know all about them. So these orbs are kind of well-known in some cultures. So anyway, these are just little glimpses. There's a lot in my books, and those are just little three little uh, examples. Wow. Okay, so we had a show about that, the orange orbs like these amberish colored orbs orbs that a lot of people see uh tim doyle from ufo seekers who i mean is probably one of my favorite ufo ufo researchers because he doesn't just uh, he really does extensive research and isn't so quick to call things ufos when they could be military or some you know aerial phenomena that that is already there but uh he caught some of these things and they were moving so fast that the only way he could catch them was with still photography. And they looked like just kind of amberish balls of uh, translucent light, maybe, that went into the mountains, so to speak. And um, other people have seen these things. Is that kind of the same thing, what you're talking about, these uh, amberish colored, uh, even orange orbs sometimes? Yeah, yeah. there's different different kinds, different colors, and different sizes. Most of them... I think I, I think that I think of them as being the astral body or the soul body 
um, most often uh, of people, uh, when we go out of body, we can show up in that form or when we die and, and come back into the physical plane to visit, we show up in this form. Um, and I've taken photographs of them myself and done some photography. There's some good techniques you can use to get good orb photographs. Uh, I was in the basement of a house of a well-known ghost hunter in Colorado, uh, and there were lots and lots of orbs there because he'd grown up with them. And uh, he could he could see them. on the We, we use night shot uh, infrared cameras, uh, and he could see them. They move, they move quickly. But uh, at some point I said, well, they're moving too fast for me. I, he, he was claiming he saw them and I didn't see them. And he said out loud, would an orb please stop and appear in front of Claude's camera and move slowly so he can photograph you? Within the next second or two, right in the middle of my field of view, an orb about one inch in diameter popped in about 20 feet away and then moved toward me and off to the right very leisurely. I have about 15 or 20 frames of this orb. So it responded to his command, which again shows that they are conscious. Um, but there are orbs of other, other types. Um, I, I was with a, a bunch of friends. We were doing an orb, orb hunt at a haunted area. It was a state park. And um, we weren't having much luck. But a 12-year-old girl in our group who was pretty psychic was walking back to the cabin about four o'clock in the afternoon and there was a three foot diameter orb hovering uh, right in front of the cabin. And she said, I thought it wanted me to take its picture. And she had a little camera around her neck. So she put, picks it up, snaps a picture of it, and then it moves away. And then she forgot about it. And uh, huh. her mother, she, and her mother, was came back with the developed pictures three days later, and said, "You know, honey, what's what's this?" <laughs> and, and then she remembered, "Oh yeah, that's what happened." Uh, and and this is a spectacular picture because it's in daylight. Uh, you can see the sky reflecting off the top of this thing. You can see the post of the cabin through it. Uh, you can see the grass underneath it. Uh, you know, and, and so it's a three foot diameter orb. Uh, we also got pictures uh, near uh, near graveyard, near a cemetery where there were tombstones. And I had a uh, strobe camera, a strobe, a strobe flasher, a strobe light with a battery. So it would flash periodically. And uh, we, we found that if you stand about 20 feet away and just let this thing flash near a tombstone, that every so often an orb. It looks like about a four-inch diameter bubble that would just become visible for an for an instant while the flash was happening. Um, so it looked, but with your binocular vision, you can tell that it's really twenty feet away. It's not something small and close up. It really is a bubble that's about that far away. So uh, different ways of seeing orbs, and uh, you know, pretty convincing to me that they're that they're real and that many of them are intelligent. Yeah, I'm I'm totally convinced of that too. The, la the one of the last things I guess um there is a question here. I don't know how familiar you are with mythology, but uh from Infinity Room in the chat room that says, "Could you ask if the Torsion fields are related to uh Vajra, which is Sanskrit for lightning bolt or diamond, and is Thor's hammer related to either of those?" Yeah, that's kind of like putting mythology compared to this stuff, but I think there's something there to that stuff. Have you looked into any of that? Uh, no, I have not. Uh, it's pretty clear to me that the ancients understood this energy probably much better than we do. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the, the sacred sites, um, if you go back to like the stone circles, uh, Stonehenge, uh, Avebury in England, for example, or the ley lines there, that I discovered that these ley lines are really collecting this torsion energy that it comes down from the sun and from the stars and then it can flow uh, in the earth. Typically they build ley lines in areas where the conductivity of the earth is conducive to collecting the energy. <clears throat> and it looks like the stone circles 
or a technology that they would use to then direct the energy to accomplish certain things. Um, it certainly produces a heightened sense of contact with the spirit world. It probably is an example of how we start to shift between mm. planes. We start to connect other with other dimensions, other realities when you're in those energies. And so it looks to me as though the Egyptians, or the pyramid, for example, is a very powerful torsion energy generator. Uh, at, at the peak of the top of the pyramid, there's a strong right-handed uh, torsion field. And at the base, there's a strong left-handed field. So um, there was a well-known technology that it looks like the ancients were using. In fact, when you look at the um, the way the churches were built in the Middle Ages by the Masons, uh, there is a structure to them that there's a, there's a great book I, that I reference in my second volume uh, where you can see that they've they've uh, mapped the ley lines, they've mapped the flow of the subtle energy as it moves through the earth, and you can see that churches were oriented so that the main axis was east-west with, uh, I guess, east toward the rising sun, and the typically the, um, let's see, it's the the red energy, the left-handed torsion, I think that goes down the aisle. I may have that backwards, but so, so one of the polarities, one of the one of the handednesses, okay, of the torsion, has a stream that flows down the aisle of the church, and the other stream crosses that first stream at the um, at the pulpit at the at the center where the, the, the priest will be uh, speaking from. And what that has the effect of is then it's linking the audience to the message of the priest. And it's pretty clear that the, the Masons were using this technology, which is probably a very ancient technology, mm -hmm. which is torsion, torsion again, uh, to make their sacred sites more potent. Yeah, it's definitely clear about all of that as well. Uh, Man, I've got so much to talk about this, and I was going to do it in the last hour, but I've, I'm afraid, like you, Doc, I might have to go because I've got quite an emergency going here. Um, but you know, I've got to say, I cannot wait to dive into your work, and I'll, obviously, I would love, love the chance to talk to you again once I've done my due diligence when it comes to reading your work and really start putting some of these pieces together with the esoteric. And just to ask you some questions about the, you know, the left brain side of this, m sure. maybe in the future, that would be great. Um, and let, let, me, let me just say quickly, I think I said this to you, but I'm not sure if I said it on air, that I've, I've pretty much stopped selling my books on Amazon because I would like to keep people's emails and be able to stay in touch. And also because Amazon takes a big chunk out of the price so I can lower the price. So the best way is to go to my, my website, synchronizeduniverse.com. And, and purchase them there. There's a tab a labeled bookstore. Uh, you can you know buy the books there. And there's quite a bit about the books that are on the website. Fantastic. Um, and um, when you buy the book, we can put our email and stuff in there for you to contact us later as well? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I would love that. If you have questions or want to talk about them more, absolutely. That would be, be great. Well, thank you so much for coming on the broadcast. I mean, this really does... Uh, add a lot of stuff up to me. I really appreciate you coming on this late at night and hanging out with us, Void Walker, so to speak. Right? Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Thank you. You're welcome. SynchronizedUniverse.com dot com is the website, and that was uh, Doctor Claude Swanson. You guys, uh, I've got to roll out of here because <clears throat> I've got somebody that uh, is very close to me is in the hospital, and they're not doing real good. So it's kind of one of those deals where. I've got to be there, and I mean, if it was, if it's, I mean, I don't have to explain myself. Most of you guys would do the same thing, right? And uh, I wanted to, I will talk about this because as we were doing this interview, there's a lot of things we've talked about in the show that I haven't brought up, kind of like Eyes has talked about, that I haven't brought up, that I know relates to what he's talking about, and I will either write a blog post about it. Either way, you got my word. I'm going to follow up with this, and it's going to be very very interesting, but I do got to cut out early tonight, unfortunately. Tomorrow night we'll be back, full show, open lines. Barbara Faith Charlton will be with us, EFT, uh, tapping, 
paranormal trauma. We're going to talk about that as well as hopefully Ronnie McMullen will join us and we'll get the open lines going again. And uh, I'm going to play this Void Walker clip one more time as we get out of here. You guys get in, get in on this because it's going to be a documentary type thing. All right. And please don't copy the show without written permission, uh, especially on YouTube. Music was by Chronox at chronoxofficial.com. Uh, guitars by Bundy. And I want to give a big, big shout out to Pacho for booking this uh, show. Thank you so much, brother. Don, Eric Markham, my partner on the network, as well as uh, Maggie Dean, Maggie Dean Radio, and uh, Jeremy Scott, a program director. We'll see you guys tomorrow night. Go to the contact page. Hit that orange button. Give us a shout out. We'll see you guys tomorrow night. Good night. I do not know all the answers to the questions about reality. I do not claim to know the ultimate truth about life. I seek that which has been made hidden as a part of a family of explorers of consciousness. I am a void walker. Hey, this is No Way Jose, a Northern California Piscean stuck in the Arizona desert. I'm a void walker and I got the shoes to prove it. So what do I do when my soul yearns to delve deep into the realm of the unknown? I aim my satellite straight into the night sky and catch a smooth ride on the KTLK DB radio waves. I tune into Lighting the Void with Joe Root on the French FM. Joe, Lighting the Void is the best show on the planet. This is Barney, your friend from Facebook. Thank you and all the crew for all you do. Namaste, my friend. This is Macon from the Foothills of North Carolina, and I am a board walker. G'day, board walkers. This is Lily from Down Under Australia. The world may be small, but the enigma is great. So let your curiosity take you for a journey with Joe Root. Hey, this is V, coming in from Central Maryland, and I am a void walker. This is Kevin Darkerty, a beginner void walker. I'm from Vancouver, BC. I know a little about a lot, and you know, as Leonard Skinner said, I guess the rest. I learned a lot from uh, Mr. Root in the show. And I uh, heard it from the beginning. I knew right then he was going to be a New York Bell. Thanks for all your uh, shows and keep it up. Hey, this is Derek from Mass, a.k.a. the Night Stalker, and I'm a Void Walker. This is Mark from Chicago, and I walk the Void to ascertain what is consciousness. My name is Jared Johnson, and I'm from Humboldt County, California. I do not know all the answers to the questions about reality. I do not claim to know the ultimate truth about life. I seek that which has been made hidden as a part of a family of explorers of consciousness. I'm a void walker. Thanks, Jaru. The views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the Fringe FM, KTLK Digital Broadcasting, its sponsors, affiliates, or staff. Listener discretion is advised.